Welcome to another great show right here on IT Pro TV. You're watching the CompTIA IT Fundamental Show. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're in a part three on security best practices. And here, of course, to help us as we continue on this journey is going to be, well, Mr. Don Pazette himself. Don, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I am doing great. Ready to dive into our, our final leg of the security best practices trifecta. Uh, what we've got here is probably one of the more important parts. We're going to talk about safe browsing habits. So when you're browsing the internet, it's a dangerous world out there. And most of the time, we can recognize threats ahead of time and stop from getting our machines infected or, or systems compromised if we know what to look for. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we'll take a look at some additional security features uh, that may or may not be an issue for you, but things like validating file downloads, making sure we're downloading from safe sites, uh, and then just doing general updates to keep our systems patched and protected and safe and secure. And with that, it'll kind of round off our security best practices series. Now, Don, as I continue to read and, and browse around on the internet, I keep seeing where all these browsers are saying they're the safest browser that's ever come out. What do we mean by that? And, and what do we are, how are we gonna do this idea of safe browsing? All right, so web browsers play a big part in our everyday experience. A lot of people use email, photos, file storage, all via a web browser. And that web browser is responsible for providing security end to end between you and the server that you're communicating to. And a lot of times they do that with SSL. We took a look at SSL a little bit in the last episode, but if you want to revisit that, like I've got Google's web page pulled up right here. So I went to Google's website and up in the little address bar way up here at the top, I can see the green secure lock right there that shows that this is a secure website. It's using HTTPS. Uh, this looks a little different. I think in the last episode, I was in the Microsoft Edge browser. I'm in the Google Chrome browser now, which is why it looks a little different. Um, so it shows up here. I know that it's secure. And so I know that I'm browsing to a site that I can trust, right? Or can I? Hey, why should I trust it? Well, you don't necessarily trust it. What happens here is a, it's called a chain of trust, right? I trust that the web browser I'm using was made by a company that they trusted and that that company trust another company. And then as long as that trust chain is all intact and every company along it trusts each other, then we end up with a valid set of trust and we get the secure icon there. Now, you may not trust them. I'm using Google Chrome and I'm browsing to Google's website. They could be lying to me. This could not be encrypted at all but they're just making it a green icon because they control the browser and they control the site. They can do that, right? But I'm trusting Google that they're not doing that. Yeah, the browser is functioning the way that it's supposed to. If I wanted to test, I could double check. I could fire up another browser. I could fire up Firefox or Safari or Edge and browse and see, do I get the green lock there? And if I don't, then maybe Google is lying to me. But how many people do that, right? How many end users bother with any of what I just said? Most of them don't, right? They just trust that the browser they're using is functioning the way that it's supposed to. But there are many times where websites aren't trustworthy. And this little green lock can actually take several other forms. There's a fun website where you can see this. Uh, it's called badssl.com. If you go to badssl.com, they have a number of examples on their website of what it's like when an SSL certificate isn't correct, when something is wrong on it. And it's kind of ironic because when you go to their site, um, the main site, SSL is actually set up right. So you will, it's, it's good SSL on the homepage. But on the page, it then has links to all sorts of sub pages that are configured with SSL either poorly or weakly. All right. Let me talk a little bit about terminology here because a lot of us say SSL. SSL is secure socket, uh, secure socket layer. And what SSL did is it was the original way of providing encryption. Well, there were three versions of it, SSL 1, 2, and 3. All three have been broken. Uh, so security researchers have been able to decode and break them, but they're not considered secure. So a few years back, SSL was replaced with TLS, Transport Layer Security. Well, Transport Layer Security does the same thing. So most people just call it SSL. We still say SSL today, even though it's actually TLS. Well, TLS has three different versions. The first one has been broken, TLS version 1. TLS version 1.1 has been shown to be theoretically breakable. And so the newer one, TLS version 1.2, is now considered the secure or securest, most secure yeah. uh, of the, the ones that are out there. So when you browse to a website, which one are you using? Most people don't know. It's, it's a green lock, right? Isn't that enough? 
Not necessarily. You could have a green lock, but you're using an older protocol. And so your browser is supposed to test for that. And a page like this is neat because you can click on some of these. Like if I click on the TLS version one, it's taking me to a website that's running TLS version one, which is not considered secure. But look what Chrome did up here. I still get the green lock. It's still treating it as secure, even though it's not necessarily as secure as we'd like it to be. And other browsers may handle that different. So for example, if I go into Microsoft Edge and I go to that same address here, all right, Microsoft Edge flags it as secure, but just gives it a gray lock instead of a green lock. So it's telling me that it's not as secure as it could be, uh, but that it is considered secure. My data is being encrypted, just not with the strongest algorithm possible. And so that, that is something that happens. As an end user, it's a little too much to expect end users to go and dig into what algorithm is being used by what site. But training them to look for that green lock, that's really the first step to making sure that you browse safely. That anytime you're on a website and you're about to punch in a password, you're about to punch in a credit card number, you're about to punch in any personal information, social security number, whatever, that you take a quick glance and you look up at that bar and you say, is it secure? All right. And if it isn't, if it's got any kind of problem, we shouldn't be using it. So for example, that certificate that they're using to sign it, it has an expiration date. Let's say it's expired. If it's expired, you'll get a warning like this telling me your connection is not private. It's warning me. Date invalid right there. The certificate's expired. I shouldn't be using it. But you know what? As a user, I can just say, well, I'm going to go to advanced. I'm going to say proceed anyway. What do I care? And now I'm on the website, right? But up here in my bar, I see that it's all red now. It's not secure. My data is being encrypted. It's just being encrypted with a certificate that's expired. And so if I know to look for that, then I know, all right, I should not be entering in a password. I should not be entering in a credit card number on a site that is flagged like this. Where this is really true is wrong host. If the host name doesn't match the name on the certificate, that usually means you're being routed to a malicious website. And you'll get this common name invalid. And that's telling me that the server name doesn't match the name that I typed. Whatever I typed in isn't matching the name on the server. So I've likely been routed to the wrong server. And again, I can bypass that. I can say, whatever, I'm going. What do I care, right? And my address bar will update to be red, but it lets me do it. Computers generally assume you know what you're doing. Well, you might be surprised how many people don't know what they're doing. They don't care. Like, I just need to get onto this website. I don't care about the certificate thing. That's somebody else's problem. Well, it actually is your problem if it's your data that gets compromised as a result. So if you're ever bored, go to badssl, uh, badssl.com, and you can click on all these links, and they're just all sorts of different examples that show you really strong certificates, really weak certificates, certificates that are broken, and gives you kind of an experience of what that looks like. And that way you can train yourself and train your users about what to be looking for when they browse the web. And you can do this in your web browser of choice so you see the alerts their way. I've been using Google Chrome in this episode. Maybe you use Firefox. Well, it looks different. Uh, Firefox, for example, won't let you bypass like I've been doing. So it protects you a little more. Uh, Google Chrome lets you bypass. Microsoft Edge lets you bypass. So some of them do, some of them don't. But you can kind of see it uh, as it pertains to the browser of your choice. Now there's other features that are kind of nested away inside of your browser too. So for example, when I go to a website, it might be perfectly secure, but there might be elements on the page that aren't, all right? So for example, here's an Adobe page. And on this Adobe page, if I look at it up here, actually I've got a couple of problems. So it says HTTPS, it's encrypted, right? Adobe, they, they make Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Acrobat, the PDF reader, and they make Adobe Flash. I'm on the Adobe Flash Player website. And I've got a letter I here instead of a lock. What's up with that, right? What I'm looking at here is a mixed content page where some of the page is encrypted and some of it isn't. And as a result, if I'm looking at the page, I actually don't know what parts are encrypted and what parts aren't. What if the whole page was encrypted except for the credit card field? And now I go and type my credit card in there. I wouldn't know, that's a, that's a red flag. All right. And sometimes if you click on that letter, it'll tell you what's happening. And here it just says, my connection is not fully secure. It's saying the certificate is valid. That's good, right? But there's some elements on here that aren't secure. And in this case, what's going on 
is there's an Adobe Flash plugin that's trying to be loaded and Chrome is stopping it from loading. I know that because I can see it right here. This weird little puzzle piece, right? Inside of Google Chrome, they display this pu puzzle piece anytime there's additional software that needs to be used to launch a page. Now, with Adobe Flash Player, it's perfectly safe. I want that to run. I want it to show some fancy animation or whatever. But this could also be malware. An attacker could write software. I don't want their software to run. So Google is giving me the chance to say, is this something that I trust or not? And if it is, if I trust it, I can click on it, and it's going to say, do I want to allow it to run the Flash? I can say allow, and now it's going to run. And instead of seeing that little puzzle piece, now I actually see this block here telling me I've installed a particular version. It's actually working and Flash is in place. So that kind of functionality happens there. This is another part of safe browsing. We need to understand what's going on as, as far as the elements that are being loaded. Plugins and extensions can be very dangerous. Most web browsers don't have them enabled by default, but make it where you can install them if you want, right? Chrome is like that. Uh, with Chrome, you actually have the Chrome Web, I think it's called the Chrome Web Store. And if you go to the Chrome Web Store, you can install all sorts of extensions and plugins that increase what your browser can do. Well, are these trustworthy? Most of them are, right? Uh, you know, it's probably like Pinterest, right? Uh, Pinterest, they're a big company. They're not going to do anything nefarious, are they? <laughs> right? Sometimes they do. The smaller companies though, that you've never heard of, there you don't know. And there are some that steal your information. If it's hooked into the browser, it can see every site that you go to. It can see all the data that you type, everything that you do in the browser, which for most people is everything they do. A lot of people, their whole day is just spent in the web browser. So that is a very, very dangerous thing. So we always have to be very careful with plugins that we install, with any extension, with software like Java and Flash, those things. We want to keep those to a minimum or not at all, right? If you don't have to have that software, you don't want to you uninstall software that you don't need. Just remove it, be done with it, and then that way it's one less area where you might be weak. All right, Don, along with all this, uh, you had mentioned it right at the beginning of this episode, the idea of working with downloads. Uh, what, what is it about a download that could be bad? All right, anytime we get files from the internet, you're at risk, right? They could be infected. And the web browser plays a big part in that. So let's say, for example, I want to download a file transfer client. I use a little file program called FileZilla, right? FileZilla is free. You can go to the FileZilla website and download it and get it. I have a problem, though which after all these years, I've used this software for over a decade, I can never remember the website's <laughs> address because it's something like filezilla-project.org or something annoying. I, I can never quite get it right. So I always do a Google search. So I go and I do a Google search just like this. I say, I want to download FileZilla. And so what does Google respond with? Well, the very first link right here, FileZilla, HTTPS colon slash slash filezilla-project.org actually remembered the address for once. Uh, so there it is. I can go to it. That's the legitimate site. That's where I want to go. All right. So that, that worked. That's good. But let's scroll down a little bit. I know that's the official site of FileZilla because I've, I've used it for years, right? But maybe this is the very first time I've been exposed to it, right? Maybe I've, I've never downloaded it before. Well, Google found 4.8 million results. <laughs> and if we start looking at some of those other results, if we scroll down... These are filezillaproject.org, that's good. Then we get sourceforge.net. All right, I actually do know SourceForge. They're, I'm not gonna call them a great company. I don't wanna call them a bad company. They're like a mediocre company. Sometimes they try and sneak in some ads and things. But then we start getting down to Softonic, FileHippo, um, download.cnet.com, FossHub. We start coming across other websites that we may or may not know. And it just gets worse as you start jumping further back in your search results. Um, well, I guess University of Ohio, you could probably trust them, <laughs> right? Um, My.bluehost.com, cityattorney.cityofboise.org. I'm going to find some interesting uh, ones here. Computer build. Vodapapple.com. Yeah, some of these I, I've never even heard of. So if I want to download FileZilla, do I want to download from one of these sites? Probably not, right? FileZilla is free. It's absolutely free. So anybody can download FileZilla. And what a lot of these sites will do is they will package adware, software that displays advertisements. They'll package it with it. And when you go to download that software, you're downloading FileZilla, but you're also downloading this advertising software too. And when you do that, you install it. You willingly install this software 
you're installing the software you wanted and the advertising software you didn't want. We have to be on the lookout for that. And that's why it's so important to download files from the official manufacturer. They call it the OEM, right? The original equipment manufacturer, but it's not really equipment here, it's software. But you want to get it from the OEM, from the first party site. When you go to third party sites like these, like when I go to File Hippo, do I, do I know File Hippo? I don't, right? Maybe, maybe they're legit. Maybe it's a great service and they provide faster downloads than anybody on the planet. Maybe. I've never heard of them. So they could just as well be attackers that are packaging ad software in there. Um, SourceForge, remember how I mentioned they're, they're not a great company, they're not a bad company? Um, they package advertising with some of their downloads and they just kind of make it kind of hard to find the link that downloads it without the advertising, which I think is a shady practice. But, uh, but anyhow, so you've got those options. You need to be aware of it. So for example, um, let's say that I wanted to download software like Fedora Workstation. That's a Linux operating system you can download for your system, uh, for your, any you know, laptop or desktop. It's free. Well, it's free so they don't make money on it. So how are they paying for all the downloads? Well, they use a network of mirrors, a number of different servers that are out there where people volunteer and say, hey, I'll, I'll hold a copy of your software so people can download it for me. That's how they defer or defray the cost. Well, the problem is when I go to download the software, how do I know if I can trust it? How do I know if I can trust the software from them? And the short answer to that is um, it does come down to trust, just whether you blindly trust that company or not. The longer answer is that there's a ton of tools that are out there that actually allow you to truly validate that the file came from them. They're all just hard to use. And because they're hard to use, most people won't use them. So I'll just use this as an example. If I want to download Fedora, it's going to download an ISO image. I think it's around four gigabytes in size, so a pretty decent sized file. An attacker could have modified that file and put anything in there. I wouldn't know. It's four gigs. I'm not going to dig through the whole thing. It would take forever, right? So I have to trust it. Well, if I scroll down and I look at the download information here, they actually have an option right here that says verify this image. And if you click on verify this image, it takes you to this crazy screen here, right? Where it shows me just a bunch of stuff, right? There's a SHA-256 hash, there's a PGP signature. What is all this stuff? These are digital signatures that the Fedora team made that say basically you can download the file from wherever you want, any server, any server on the entire planet, you can download it. And then you can take a hash of your file and compare it to this. And if they match, then you know you got the legitimate real file. It works, it's perfect, it's foolproof. This lets me know that I got the real file, right? But it's a pain, it's, <laughs> it's tough to do. Most users aren't gonna do it. So let me show you what I would have to do. So I can see right here, this Fedora ISO, uh, here's the Fedora Workstation Live ISO right here, version 1.1, and they're giving me a hash for it. That's this number right here, okay? So I can, I can take that number and uh, you know, maybe I'll drop that into some kind of text editor or something uh, just so I can hold on to it. And let me do a new document and we'll drop it in here. And uh, man, I can't read that. That is way too small. So let's go for a nice giant font here. All right, so here it is. This is the hash straight from the Fedora team. Okay, so I've got that right here. Then I can go and download the file which I've, I've already done, so if I find it, there it is, and I can generate my own hash. Now, first off, you see I'm in a terminal, so already you know we're in trouble, right? <laughs> hey, most users are not gonna drop to a terminal, but I can run the SHA sum utility. I have to know that it's a 256-bit algorithm. They told me that on the website, but I have to know to type it into the command, and then I can run that against that Fedora ISO that I downloaded. And when I run it, it's gonna calculate a checksum on that file, and it's gonna generate a number. And once that number comes up, and I say a number, it's hexadecimal, so it's letters and numbers. But when that number comes up, I can then take that and I can compare the result. I can go back over to my text window here and I can paste in what I got, which of course is gonna be a different font size. So let me get that into the same font size. Whoop. Oh, I see it, it uh, brought over the whole formatting and everything, great. There. And now I can compare, I can look down the list and say, does it match, right? And as I look, I can see BD5C9, BD5C9. At the end here, 7BFB. At the end of this one, 7BFB. They match. They're identical. 
if even one bit, one tiny one or zero was changed in that four gigabyte file, this checksum would be different. It wouldn't match. It would fail. And as a result, I would know that the file had been tampered with or, or was damaged, right? It could get damaged during the download, but it could be tampered with, right? This is a way to check. This is a great method. It works great. But how many of you out in TV land have even seen the SHA sum command? Better yet, used it on a download file like this. How many times do you go to a website to download something like, like FileZilla, right? So let's say I want to download it, right? Perfect. I'm going to go to their download page. I'm going to go and download it. And here, download the client right here. And I'm going to click on it. And it takes me to a download link. And I've got some various download options. I can choose what it is I want. I can pull some additional download options. And as I start going through, here's the downloads. And there's no SHA sums. There's no checksums. They're not even being provided for me. There's no way for me to validate that this is what I want. And that's a big challenge that we have too. If they don't give you a way to validate, it doesn't matter that you have the tools, you won't be able to use it. But when you can, when you download files, make sure you download them from trusted sources from the OEM if you can. And if not, make sure you have some way to do checksums. And if you can't do either, you shouldn't be running the file. The best practice is not to run the file, not to use it because you can't trust that that data is safe. All right, Don, well, helping us out and understanding this idea of safe browsing habits as well as using downloads is a great uh, uh, tool for us in terms of security practices. But earlier on, you had also mentioned the idea of patching our computers. Where do we begin with that? All right, patching used to be really hard, but it is a great way to secure a system. The operating system manufacturers all recognize that now. And so now updates are actually a heck of a lot easier and super easy to get going, usually turned on by default on your machine. But as a best practice, you want to make sure that you double check that, that updates are being turned on and that they're being applied. Basically what happens is companies like Microsoft and Apple, Google, they watch for when there are problems, when there are bugs and exploits that attackers can take advantage of. And as soon as they spot one, they try and fix it. They write a fix for it and then they push it out to all the machines across the planet to protect them. Well, your machine has to be ready to receive that. Okay, ready to receive it, listen, and apply the update. And that should be happening automatically, all right? But you can double check. In the Microsoft world, you use a program called Windows Updates. And if you were to just bring up your start menu like I'm gonna do. So in Microsoft Windows, we're gonna use what's called Windows Updates. And I'll show you how it works. Uh, it's probably already configured on your system, but I'm just gonna bring up my start menu and type update. And I'll see right here where I can check for updates. And that's kind of a start. I wanna check for updates right now but I need updates to run all the time. So right beneath that, I've got my Windows Update settings. And I can go into my Windows Update settings and I can see I'm up to date. Last time I checked, 9.45 a.m. Looking at my clock, it's 11.59 a.m. right now. So I checked just a, a couple hours ago to see if there were updates. So this is very, very recent. I know that I'm doing updates. And I can go into my advanced options and here's where we can start to tweak what type of updates I want to have happen. And I have some of the advertising stuff turned off, but then you have other things on here like which updates are going to be installed and, and uh, uh, how far off I want to defer an update. Mine are set to zero. I don't want to defer updates. I want to get the updates right away. And the security updates are normally deployed right away. You get them very, very quickly. But the key thing here is to make sure that your updates are turned on and that you are doing them, that they're being installed and get put in place. Now, one reason that people don't do updates is they usually make your computer reboot and people get annoyed with that. They need to use their computer. So a nice thing that Microsoft does is they let you change your active hours. And you can set in here and say, you know what? I use my computer from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So don't do updates during that time. Do the updates after 5 p.m. when I'm not using it. Maybe this is my home computer. And at home, I usually use my computer in the evening. So I might come in here and say, well, actually I use my computer from 5 p.m. until midnight. And so you can come in and punch that or uh, you know, maybe 1 a.m. Maybe I stay up late all the time. So I'm just gonna punch that in. So from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m., that's when I use the computer. Don't mess with it, right? <laughs> and then after 1 a.m., it can apply the updates if I leave my computer on or in the middle of the day, it can apply the updates. But you need to set this so that it doesn't interfere with you and it doesn't encourage you to cancel an update or skip an update. You need to apply those updates as soon as you can, all right? On the Mac side, it's very similar, except instead of having its own app, it's actually managed by the App Store. So if I go to a Mac, like this one, well, which is what we were using earlier in the show, and I go into the App Store, inside of the Apple App Store, 
they have updates right up here. You'll see mine's already checked to kind of see an update. And I've got an update for iTunes. Got to have iTunes 12.7.4. I'm sure it's the best iTunes ever. Yeah. Uh, so I can go and I can download that. But security updates would come this same way. And if I go into the App Store Preferences, inside of the App Store Preferences, I'll see where I can define whether it's automatically checking for updates, whether it's just downloading the updates and that's it, or if it's actually downloading and installing the updates. That was off by default. Maybe I wanted to install. On Windows, it installs by default. On Mac, it doesn't. So I might want to turn those on. That would be a good best practice to set and say, I need those installed. I need them up. Maybe not app updates. Maybe the OS updates are more important, but usually it's both because apps can be just as vulnerable as the operating system they run on. So we can turn that on, get that set up. Uh, we can tell it to check for updates right away, or we can look at existing updates that have already been installed. And when you jump in, you'll, you'll get a chance to see what's there and you can apply your updates. Uh, you can defer them just like in the Windows world. You can say like, remind me tomorrow or, or whatever. But the longer you wait, the longer your computer is vulnerable. So as a best practice, we wanna make sure that we're updating as soon as feasibly possible. You do need to use your computer. You do need to be able to, to use it for the, the purpose it was created, but you need to be applying updates usually daily. You know, that you don't want to go longer than a day if you can avoid it. There's going to be times where you can't, but new attacks, new exploits, new bugs come out every single day. So you need to update to be able to stay on top of that. All right, Don. Well, thank you for helping us here in terms of the different uh, safe browsing habits, as well as the idea here of patching and updating our computers. These are important best practices for security that we can implement on our own without really needing a bunch of help, but at the same time, without you knowing about it, you may not have any of the idea of what to do in terms of safe practices uh, for browsing or the idea of updates. All right, Don, any last wise words before we sign off? Uh, we covered a lot of things here, and it was all done from the IT fundamentals perspective. So these are things that every IT security worker should be doing. Every home user should really be doing it as well. If you decide that you really like security, you want to get into the world of hacking, penetration testing, and so on, we haven't even scraped the tip of the iceberg. There's just so much more to the field. If you're trying to discover exploits and vulnerabilities, it's a it's a really uh, engaging career field to choose in. I mean, you feel like you're you're in virtual combat all the time. Uh, so a lot of people find fun in that. If you enjoy it, be sure to continue on to do things like the CompTIA Security Plus, uh, the CASP certification, they have Pen Test Plus, and Cybersecurity Analyst Plus. All of those certifications go far more in depth into the security world. But everything we covered in these three parts are things that everybody should be doing, even non-security people, just regular average Joes uh, should be doing to protect their machines and to keep their data safe. All right then, well, thank you also for watching today. So signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Don Pazette. Stay tuned right here for more of your CompTIA IT Fundamental Show. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.